from the question number one. I say, why is it important to read and study all parts of Scripture? Why is it important? Do I call names? Okay. Yeah, of course, go ahead. Hallelujah. Is the manual of life. So for anybody to function well, need to read through it. Just like in a Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scriptures are given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine or reproof so that the man of God be uh, furnished to do the good work. So without the scripture, without reading the whole parts of the Bible, you will never be able to understand the will of God. The perfect thing to do. Thank you very much because of our time. Actually, yeah, it is important. This is a full package God has given to man. So you never can, you know, choose where to read and where not to read. Like where we've read today, you can see what God can teach you individually based on this. But if you look at it from a kind of point of view, you may just ignore it, not you know, digesting the full package of the scripture. It says, uh, we are going to consider the lesson this morning in four subheadings, as the, the time permits us. Number one, the patriarch of humanity and the triumph of divine purpose. Uh, second subheading, the progenitors of Israel and lineage of Christ. Number three, problems of Israel's ancestry. And finally, Progress and triumph of the righteous. Quickly, number one, uh, subheading the patriarch of humanity and the triumph of divine purpose. From uh, our text in First Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. Someone should please quickly help us to read. First Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. If I quickly help us because we don't have much time on our side. Hallelujah. Mahalini and Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shen, Ham. Japheth, the sons of Japheth, Goma, Magon, and Meda, and Javin, and tu Tuba, and Me Meshech, and Teras. The six, the sons of Goma are, the sons of Goma are, Akshek Nase, Rifat, and Tutama. Seven, the sons of Jeva is Elisha, the Tishmai, Tik, Kit Tim, and Don Dudan, and the sons of Ham, Kosh, Misraim, Put, and Kena. Verse 9 The sons of Kosh, Seba, Havla. Sad that. Uh, you can stop there. And praise, praise the Lord. Lord. So, you see, this is the general, you know, wide documentation of how humanity comes to existence. So, it started with Adam. It says here, Adam, Seth, Enoch, Canaan, MacLeod, Jerel. Verse 2. Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So this is just broad, you know, uh, existence of humanity. So you will see from Adam, all these people came up. Then from there to the time when God destroyed the earth, Noah now was reestablished. And you can see the children of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, whom God used to populate the whole earth. So but this, what is this teaching us? It shows us the reality and the, you know, the authentic, authenticity of God's promises. 
God has created man to refute, to multiply and replenish the earth. Though Satan tried to thwart the whole uh, plans, but yet God is God. He cannot change. So he did all he could to accomplish his word that cannot return unto him void. So here you can see from Noah, the earth now was repopulated. So here also we can learn how God, you know, because if the names we have here is about 368, you know, all those names comprises male and female. How God established the earth, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So that is a principle, you know, a concept that is viable. That is not how you can reproduce without male and female coming together. So you see the establishment of God stands and stands forever. No matter the notion or opinion of man to reestablish concept that does not, you know, work. That is not how a man can, and a man can reproduce. Not a woman and a woman can reproduce. There must be male and female. So for the earth to be populated. And in all that, God has shown us practical example of how his word will stand forever. And that gives us confidence in whatever God says. And we should, you know, it is an, 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 an authentic check that can never bounce. So here, all effort to destroy his plans was not, you know, accomplished. So it is a good lesson for us to trust God and abide in his precepts because his words, Bible says, they are yea and amen. Number two, headings, which is the, pro, the, the progenitors of Israel and lineage of Christ. In second, first Chronicle chapter 2, chapter 2 from verse 1 to 5, because of our time, we will have read to even to 17, but quickly someone should help us to read 1 to 5. the progenitors of Israel and lineage of Christ, how Jesus came to the world to save humanity, the source. We have read that of Adam, how you and I, everyone comes from his offspring. And also now we're going to see how God, you know, narrowed the journey towards his chosen vessel. First Chronicle chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. First Chronicle chapter one verse sorry, chapter two verse one to five. Chapter two. Those are the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, and Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Continue. Okay, two, three. The sons of Judah. Er, and Onan, and Shela, Ohish, three were born into him of the daughter of Shua, the Canaanites, the Cana and Er, the firstborn of Judah, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he slew him, and Tamar, his daughter, his daughter-in-law, bare him, Perez, and Zerah, all the sons of Judah will five. The sons of Perez, Ezra, and Hamul. Hamul. Thank you very much. God bless you. See, see Abraham, Ab Abraham, which is Abraham, the same as Abraham, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. All other nations except the progeny of Abraham drop out of focus in the text as the light zeroed more brightly towards the lineage of the Savior of the world. You see, from where we read now, it's just narrowed to the family of Abraham. Abraham, God promised him as far as before our days that in his seed, in his name, shall the whole families of the earth be blessed. So today, is that prophecy real or not? We, can be, we, are, we are all, you know, witness to that. We are children of Abraham through Jesus Christ. But when this, promises, this promise was made, it was something that seems as if it will not come to pass. But at the process of time, God made 
that promise to be fulfilled. Matthew Gospel began the genealogy of Christ with Abraham, the father of the faithful. God promised in the text is to underline the immortality of his counsel and continual faithfulness to his promise of the Messiah. Mentioned at the first incidence of sin. You know, God, when Adam sinned, if you read in Genesis chapter 3, God categorically made it clear that that will not be the end of the world uh, because he has already given the earth to be managed by humanity. So giving it out to Satan, whom he never proposed, will not be the final end. From there, he may mention how, how the earth will be redeemed. You know, that was how now he's tried, and that devil, as you can see today, he's, 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 he's never relented in his own action. He knew that God has made up his mind to restore the earth. He did all he could. You can see the Bible said in chapter 6 of Genesis that the level of sin became so unbearable that it even, God even regretted of creating man. But what he did he do? He now looked for a righteous person to reestablish the earth. He saw only one man, irrespective of the time spent to, to, to populate the earth. He doesn't even mind. He chose only that man that was righteous and destroyed the rest of the earth. So that was how now Noah and his children came to, you know, existence. And now the same devil, you know, disguised again to jump into Noah in order to lay a curse on one of his children so that the devil will see somewhere to anchor. So if you look at the history of humanity, I mean, you will, you will, you will puzzle a why and, know, and, you know, and go into deep research, apart from Christianity or whatever, on what happens to humanity. And all these things are in the Bible, so that you can know the reason why has, God has given certain instructions. So no one needs to persuade you to help yourself, because this very word is for your own benefit. If you look at the whole thing, uh, you know, uh, 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 how everything, you know, happens is so complicated that you cannot even figure out. But the only thing you can understand is that you follow the word of God and live successfully. If you deviate from it, obviously uh, it's, uh, you are here to face the wrath. So you can see here how devil struggled. He captured in, you know, uh, Noah and God did not stop there. From that very three children that they, you know, Noah blessed. He blessed him, he blessed Shem, he blessed Japheth. I mean, uh, he blessed him and Japheth. And the word Noah pronounced Abide. You know, that word continued even to Abraham. As you can see, the pronunciation of Adam, I mean Noah, to Shem, made that very tribe to be, to, you know, to be chosen. The same thing when the, when the law would be coming from the 12, children, 12, 12 sons of uh, Jacob, Jacob pronounced in Egypt to, uh, uh, what is it called? Judah. He blessed Judah. You know, he blessed Judah and that very blessing that Jacob blessed Judah, made Judah to be the lineage by which Christ came to. So if you look, read the scripture, you will understand very well. And that will help you to know how God works. He followed obedience. He followed, you know, righteousness to establish his counsel. So, but for one that understands, he walked towards that platform. And obviously, you can see the reality because as we are reading the scripture, it seems as if it's just an abstract. But when you apply it to your life, you see the reality that, yeah, that is how God works. He may not take microphone to tell you, listen, listen. the only microphone he can give to you, to, you know, he can use to talk to you is as you are hearing the word of God now. And you have the Bible to, you know, to search and see whether all these things are real. Apart from that, there is no other thing he can do. He has already given us all what we need. It says here, from our text here, is um, after the disruption and the confusion in Israel uh, in, engendered by Babylonian captivity, it became necessary to clearly isolate and identify once again the royal, priestly, and other families line of, uh, in Israel through the compilation of this genealogy in the text. It was intended to establish the uh, congress of the scripture prophecy. That is the to, 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 to the agreement of the scripture prophecy with the factual advent of Messiah. God has said it. So all these things brings to bear 
the confirmation of God's word. So there is nothing the devil can do about that. The genealogy lineage pro uh, progressed from Abraham, whose encounter with God brought a change of name and life, to his son Isaac after the brief excursion into the lineage of Ishmael and the other sons of Abraham by Keturah. The text focuses on Jacob, which is Israel, the son of Abraham. I mean, the, 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 the direction of Abraham. These are the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Among the 12 sons of Jacob, the focus now zero on to the son of Judah. The prominence according to According, according to the family of Judah in a con 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 consonance with the prediction that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. See, do you see where that blessing comes? God, Abraham, blessed Judah. And that was why Judah, irrespective of the shortcoming, God granted him that favor. So, you can see how God can take away man's depravity and bestow what that is not defeated to man upon man by his grace. So, but what are we learning from this? Because of our time, if you read deep and deep into what we have read, you can see how this whole journey started. It didn't just happen. God blessed, you know, he used um, Jacob to bless Judah. That very journey started from Noah, from Shem. The disobedient and defiant behavior of Ham brought woe to his descendant. Innocent people, people that have never committed any sin, but because of the ancestral sin, it was translated to the own coming generation. Then because of the, the, the good, the behavior of Shem and Japheth, they were blessed. This very individual, he pronounced these blessings upon Shem in Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9. Then the same journey continued. That is why today that very source of Messiah came from Shem. Japheth, the, 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 Noah blessed him that he, God shall enlarge his coast. Today, it was the Europeans that dominated the whole world. They colonized the whole world. That is the children of Japheth. But Canaan, that he has already pronounced that they will be servant to their brethren. What are they today? Look at the things that are happening over there. People that never ever committed any sin, any atrocity, are suffering the fate of, you know, the ancestral misconduct. So that was why God sent Jesus Christ. That it is unfair for one to suffer such faith. It is better for you to suffer what you've committed. And the only way to do that is by giving your life to Christ. So that you will not be reckoning or be suffering what other people have done. Though it will take time for you to break off from the shackle, the accumulated bills. Because the bills have already been accumulated by the ancestors. So you don't need to look at the Europeans and you see their life moving very well and smoothly. Go and research. People do make research to understand deep things. So that is the, that is the pattern. That is how God has made man. When you see things are not working out, sit down, sit back, and then now go into research and know why that thing, uh, you know, happened and what will be the next solution. That is how you see people inventing th you know, things. So the same way, now you can understand the accumulated bills is what people are suffering because you can, well, sometimes you may, you may be imagine, okay, these people that are afflicting people over there in Africa, are they no human beings just like the Westerners? No, no conscience, no nothing. Now we need to understand the level of debt they are paying because these are the atrocities committed by the ancestors. So it is only when you break off from that yoke that you can be able to build, you know, a good platform for the upcoming generation. Because their fathers, you know, has been blessed and the God key to that very blessing and establish them. And they walk in that platform. And their children today, they are enjoying. You are angry, you don't understand. You need to work out your own salvation. God is not a partial God. Christ came for this purpose. 
you know, to destroy all the works accumulated bill and place you in a platform that you will be running on a speed lane. And your children will no longer come to face the same, you know, trouble. But when, sometimes when you're talking to a man, man will just be seeing that maybe you're trying to persuade him or coerce him to something that he never intended to do. It is for your own benefit. Read the scripture and see from the manner of it that made man what happened to humanity and how you can break off from that yoke. If you are thinking that it's something that you sleep and work and then do live as you like, you are wasting your time. That bondage will remain. You know, yeah, thank you very much. You know, our time, there is no time on our side, actually. So that is it. Question number two. Based on the reality of the scripture, what should be the believer's attitude to the prophecy that are yet to be fulfilled? From what we've read, what should be our, our attitude to the ones that are yet to be fulfilled? Quickly, please. Yeah, Sister Pamela. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Our attitude should be that we should know that God's promises in our life will never fail. It must surely come to pass. No matter it may take long, but it must definitely come to Thank pass. Thank you very Praise much. That is it. We should also understand that God, who made the ones that we are testifying today, the same God is on the throne. Question number three. From, the, from, the, from this lesson, mention two reasons. Our people shall believe and live by the Bible. Any brother this time around? From this lesson, are we not reading the booklets at home? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We can see from the Genesis to, to Chronicles it took a long time, more than a thousand of years for the two books that was written. And they stay all accounted to one, the, to the truth. They are all agreed. And these people who wrote these books are lived in two different times, but all of them agreed to the same that creation is from the Lord. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, see, that is it. You know, Genesis was written many years before the book of First Chronicle, thousands of years. Yet, there, as I said, in Genesis chapter nine, you can see compared to what we read also in First Chronicle chapter one, verse seventeen. So they all married together. So how comes it is by divine inspiration and understanding? So God has the record of everything that he made. So he can steer someone in any dispensation, in any, you know, in, at any given time, he can give him the understanding of all that have transpired, you know, thousands of years because he has the record. Uh, quickly, our second subheading, the problem in Israel's ancestry. The problem in, in, in Israel's ancestry. God's attitude to sin is revealed in the text. In the genealogy of Judah, we see the divergent ends of wicked and righteous. Even among the preferred tribe, first, it is the judgment of God on the wicked, uh, wicked son of you know, Judah. You know, El, the firstborn of Judah, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he slew him. So here, what we are learning here in this very uh, genealogy of the uh, ancestors of Israel that are good and bad. But in the summary, God always judged sin, irrespective of your choosing as a vessel or not. If you commit sin, God will not shy, he will not look away from it. He must surely judge the person. So they are supposed to be the one that will carry on the mantle of this very lineage. But unfortunately, he was slewed. You know, as I said, was somebody outside it, you know, it, it was not to be the one that would be used. But because of the sin of this individual, he was exterminated. The same thing also, the story and the history of uh, uh, Cain was also terminated. Cain supposed to carry on the journey, but Bible made us to know that, you know, Bible says in Genesis that after the birth of uh, you know, Seth, who gave birth to Enos, men start to call upon the name of the Lord. So what are we talking about? God has made you, but you can choose to live how you want to live. Sin is a debt 
to people. Why righteousness is something that, you know, is like investment. Righteousness is an investment. Not only to you, also to your upcoming generation. So here you can see a lot of people suffer, you know, terribly. For the sin of other people, you will ask yourself why. And that will tell you what the importance of your righteous living. If you, are, if you divert from the way, not only you, your children will be affected as well. So that is the implication. Because yeah, oh, that is the reason why we are reading all these things. To see how people that do not know anything about something suffered. But that has been there. You can't change it. The only thing you will do is to follow the instructions that God has given to break off from it. And finally, the last subheading uh, is the progress and triumph of the righteous. Some names in the genealogy of Judah are recorded here are, fami are families because they are mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. They include the names such as Bezalel, Boaz, Joab, Abishai, Asahel, Amasa, and others. So these are the people that you see their life where, okay, like this very individual now, Jesse, he has children. And God chose this individual, not only the, the, the sons, which is David, one of the sons were blessed, even the daughters. Those who were people that came from his lineage, their children, they were mighty. So can you see how God works? So those ones that pleased him, he makes sure that the people, their upcoming generation, they are blessed. And that is what you see today happening in the Western world. But how can you change the, you know, turn the leaf around? It's by going through the process. Except you be born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. The reality of life. Then when you got born again, what is your position? What is your, you know, your, your commitment? How, 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 what understanding do you have? Are you going to be just a believer that wants to go to heaven? Yeah, you can live righteously, but if you want to live a fulfilled life, yeah, you need to come close to the scripture to understand exactly the full concept of the scripture. And that will help you to live a life that will open the door, not only to you, not for you alone, also for your upcoming generation. So because of our time, that's why we'll draw the curtain as our pastor will come to do the summary. And also answer any question that you may have. You're welcome, sir. We thank the Lord so much for the study of this morning. And I believe that uh, the Lord has uh, spoken to us. Uh, based on what we have talked about this morning, are there questions? Questions based on the ancestors of Israel. Praise the Lord. Uh, in the uh, yes. Every Friday. Hallelujah. And uh, also today, many people are still falling into that scene. So what I'm trying to learn here that if you look at under question five, you see the apostle portrayed. A deliberate and prayerfully seriousness with which heavenly minded deliver must guide their eyes, ear, and other sense organs. So, what I'm trying to say here, he uh, said we should guide our eyes. But our eye can see, he referred to mind. Our ear can hear what, and he referred to our heart. What I'm learning here is we need to guide our heart. It's not everything that our eyes see that we refer to our man and we begin to do it. So, but I am seeing here that we should guard our eyes. Can we blind our eyes? Can we tie our eyes and begin to go in the streets? Um, <clears throat> let me read that passage again. Um, under question five, or that question four, it's, um, the case of Achan, is typical of how human depravity can defile and trouble a family or a church. And um, it went on to talk about how, you know, covetousness and things like that affected uh, Achan's walk with God. Uh, it referred also to Eve 
and to David, and what was the counsel of the writer. By, this metaphoric, by his metaphorical use of the word mortify or kill, the apostle portrays a deliberate and prayerful seriousness with which even-minded believers must guide their eyes, ears, and other sense organs so that they do not lead them into sin, but refrain from gazing upon objects of sin. I think generally what the writer is trying to uh, encourage us, uh, his reader, is already the Bible has told us that we should guide our hearts with all diligence, with, because out of it proceeded, you know, the issues of life. And if you remember, um, before I traveled, I shared a message with you talking about managing the tripartite man. And I, 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 I showed you how it is important for you to know how to manage this tripartite. I said man consists of three entities, the body, the soul, and the spirit. The information that the body, you know, gets sometimes. You, the body cannot be born again. And I give you an example of how if you watch pornography or you, or you watch things, you will be aroused. When Jesus was speaking and says that you must be born again, he's talking about the spirit man. That it is the spirit man that needs to be born again. And here we have this counsel again that is saying we should be careful about what we look on. David said that I have made a covenant, or Job rather, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look on a maid? In other words, he's saying that, look, I, I know myself. If I look on a maid, I will fall. So for that reason, I will avoid anything, anything rather that is an object of sin that could make me fall, that could make me trip. And I think the counsel here also for us is we must be very careful about the kind of things we, you know, expose ourselves to. Maybe physically or, you know, uh, the kind of films we watch, the kind of places we go to, the kind of... Uh, so we cannot blind our eyes, literally. Uh, because, you know, sometimes people will use the... Uh, the, 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 the Council of Christ, where he says that if your eyes will make you to sing, plug it out, and you go and remove your eyes. That's not what Jesus is saying. That it is better for you to, you know, make heaven without an eye than for you to have two eyes. He's not saying, he's just saying that you should mortify these things. You should put it to death. If you see that something is exposing you to things that could make you sin, you avoid it. The Bible says we should flee from all appearance of evil. And I trust that the Lord God of heaven, he will help us to do just that in Jesus' name. It's a counsel that we all need to take seriously. And I trust that the grace of God will help us to overcome all forms of temptation in Jesus' name. We... This morning, I've looked at this uh, topic, the first and second uh, 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 book, the first and second chapter of the, you know, uh, first book in Chronicles. And one thing that, you know, um, became very obvious to me when I started reading this passage, and I'm sure some of us might have noticed it, I mean, particularly for those of us that studied this from whom? Look at with me in that chapter one. <clears throat> the very opening verses. What do what do you find? You find here the um, uh, the, the genealogy of uh, Adam to Abraham. But look at how it began. Uh, first uh, Chronicles chapter one. I read from verse one. Adam said. Enos, Canaan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, and all other people. Did you notice there that the first sons of Adam were not mentioned? 
Cain and Abel should have been immediately after Adam. Then you are asking yourself, where are these people? What happened to them? You are writing about me and my genealogy, and you are not talking about James and Paul. And you now mention maybe the third child that I have. And it shows us something important. Because the chronicler, God must have inspired this writer for him to point out things that are important about what he is writing. I've heard the question many times for people that have not carefully studied the Bible. And they are trying to fault the Bible. And the question they will ask you sometimes is, oh, we read in the Bible that Adam and Eve were the first man and woman. Yes. And they had two sons. By the way, they didn't have two sons. They have three sons named in scriptures. And I'm going to show you. Then the Bible went on to talk about that they have sons and daughters. Because people now said, if Adam and Eve got, uh, have children, and their first children were Cain and Abel, so who did uh, Cain and Abel marry? And that is a logical question for somebody that has not carefully read the word of God. Come with me to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 4, I'm reading verses 1 and 2. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. In verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was the keeper of sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. And we know that in the process of time, Cain killed Abel. But come with me to verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. Remember when I read to you 1 Chronicles chapter 1 in verse 1, the Bible began with Adam and Seth, and he omitted Cain and Abel. Now, for those people that their question is, who did and we know that uh, uh, he had two children. Then one of them killed the other one. Uh, then who did um, Cain, you know, marry? Come to chapter 5 with me. For you to know that these were not just the three children that uh, Adam and Eve had. The Bible says he had other children, male and female, sons and daughters. Look at in chapter 5 in verse 4. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Cain, Abel, and Seth, were 800 years. And he did what? He begat sons and daughters. So, when this individual finished that period, that dispensation, whereby he, he, his wife conceived, uh, Cain was birthed, Abel was birthed, Abel was killed, Seth came along. The Bible says he, cons he had other children. And Cain could have married any of his sisters because back then there was no such sin as incest. There was no such time where God had told people, you cannot marry your sister. In fact, Muslims are still doing it today. Many, I mean, cultures of the world are still doing it, marrying cousins, marrying nephews, marrying, you know, within the family. So sometimes when you find individuals that are trying to, you know, portray the Bible as, you know, flawed, it's essentially because of lack of ignorance. And they just want to do it to, to, to satisfy their unbelief. And you as a Christian, this question might be put to you one day. That was why I thought I needed to share it with you. So that you'll know how to defend what you have believed. So that rather for them, for you to let one individual flood you. And because you don't know what you have believed, you have knowledge. You have enough 
from scriptures to be able to teach somebody or to correct whatever erroneous impression that the person may have. And I trust that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. As you read through, uh, by the time you come to verse 5 of that first Chronicles, what do you find? You find the Bible tells us about the descendant of Jephthah. And that is the son of Noah. And they tell us, historians tell us that, you see the sons of Jephthah, they are, he had seven children. Jephthah had quite, you know, a lot of children. And these children, they said that they are the ones that populated most parts of uh, uh, Europe. Look at, for instance, Java. They said Java came, um, is the descendant of the Greeks. You look at the other one, Goma. They said he is the one that is like the descendant of the Sumerians and the Russian plains and all those places. The other son of Jephthah was Madai. This is the one that happened to be the descendant of the Medes and the Persians of Iran. So you can see how truly we all came from Adam. Though our paths, you know, spread out and we went into different parts and different regions of the world. What about Tubal and Mesek? They said he is the one that, is, that lived in the Turkish Plato and he is the descendant. And historians, all of these people, they can trace, you know, their heritage to the, the, these sons, these people. So if the Bible tells us that we are all from the same Adam and the same Eve, people still questioning, why are you black? Why am I white? Why am I Asian? Why is the other one, you know, Indian? Why are you Igbo and the other one is Calabar. But the story this morning shows how vividly the Bible has shown us that we all came from the same root. Then why are we sometimes hostile to each other? Why are we unfriendly to each other? Why do we see each other as strangers? We look at each other and we say, oh, it's a stranger, I don't know. And here the word of God is telling us this morning that it is true, some of us have chosen our paths. The Bible tells us about Nimrod. And the Bible says in this passage that Nimrod started to become a mighty man. That Nimrod became emboldened in, in, in sin. So much. Remember, he was among the people that wanted to build the Tower of Babel and all of that. And he wanted to see God. He wanted to rebel. And, and it shows that many times in life, we choose our path. Not because God did not have original plan and purposes for us. But if we choose to go our own way. After, maybe he has repeatedly tried to bring us near and be a father unto us. Then he is left with no choice than to leave us. But I trust that the Lord will bring as many as has gone astray back home in Jesus' name. One of the other things I noticed as, as I was studying this passage was the sons of Abraham. The Bible talks about Isaac. And the purpose of God for the descendant of Isaac. And yet, God had a purpose for Ishmael too. In Genesis chapter 21 in verse 18, the Bible says God made a promise to Ishmael that I will make him great. Come with me to that passage. We are in Genesis. Look at chapter 21. Time will fail us as I round off. Look at what the Bible says in verse 18. Um, Genesis 21, 18. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. And that fulfillment came to pass, as all the Arabs 
came. Look at how Arab today is a mighty nation in wealth and all of that. And there's a lesson we can learn from that also, that there's no such thing as an illegitimate child. Oh, I was born out of wedlock, and God has no purpose for my life. God doesn't care about me. My father has rejected me. My mother has disowned me. And I am just a vagabond. There's no such thing as an illegitimate child. For every child that is conceived and given to us, it doesn't matter how they come about. Oh, you were in school. You were not ready to be married. You mistakenly wife. You were in sin. You got uh, entangled with a married man and he, he impregnated you. And for that reason, you thought you should go and kill that child because it's going to be a shame and all of that. And maybe that child will have no father to look after. There's no such thing. And the story of this individual, Ishmael, speaks to each and every one of us this morning. And I trust that the Lord God of heaven will help us in Jesus' name. Let's rise up on our feet and talk to the Lord in prayer. That all the things that the Lord has shared with us this morning, it will profit us. Let's call upon the Lord. The word of God has come to us this morning. Why don't you pray? That those things that you know not, the Lord will reveal them unto you. Talk to the Lord. That much more than mortal men can teach the Lord will speak to you to specific situations in your life that is important that you need the information that you need to know to make your walk with God better let's pray and call upon the Lord we have seen the consequences of disobedience this morning brethren how Men and women that God had great plan and purposes for, how they failed to, to achieve it. How they fell away from the purpose of God because they gravitated towards the things that was not pleasing to God. What are those things in your life that could make you fall away from the plan of God for your life? Why don't you pray? That the grace of God, the power of God, will remove them from your life this morning. Call upon the Lord. Oh yes, God has a plan, he has a purpose for you and for your children. Are you teaching your children in the way of the Lord? Are you teaching them to love and honor God? You need to do your best. You need to live by example. And by the grace of God, those children, oh yes, they themselves, they will have an encounter, a genuine encounter with the Lord. We have seen the hand of God from creation to redemption. Everywhere, how he created us, man fell away. How he tried to reconcile us back unto himself. And it shows that God has no pleasure in the sin of, in the death of any sinner. But rather that all should come to repentance. Call upon the Lord. Don't give up on that child. Don't give up on that your husband. Don't give up on that your wife. The things can still change for the better. Trust the Lord. Pray that this very morning, your purpose for the life of my entire family, it will not fail. In the name of the Lord Jesus. That the Lord God of heaven, he will bring it to pass. He is working all things together for your good. But you, you need to stay with the Lord. We need to abide with the Lord. And his grace will hold us. It will keep us. It will sustain us. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Our great and mighty God we thank you this morning for your word. We're asking and praying that all the things that you have taught us this morning, they will abide and they will bear fruits in our lives in Jesus' name. As we continue this morning, Lord, continue with us. We thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.